from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. I think I know most of you, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Bob Patrick. I'm the director of the Veterans History Project here at the Library of Congress. And we're actually thrilled today to, to be able to sponsor this program. Uh, we always welcome people who are on the same road with us, uh, people who have an have a affinity for veterans, who interview veterans, who, who do creative things around veterans. Uh, it's, uh, it's always a good to, to welcome someone on board with us uh, in, in that way. Um, just a little bit about the Veterans History Project. Uh, Veterans History Project here at the Library of Congress in our 15th year uh, is a congressional mandate to collect and preserve and make accessible the wartime memories of America's veterans. And as I said, we've been doing that for the last 15 years. Uh, we've accumulated an archive of just short of 100,000 collections of veterans from World War I all the way up to the, the current conflicts of today. Uh, that is an ongoing process that has been done through the, uh, through the efforts of volunteers literally across the country. Every state in the Union, every uh, congressional district, uh, everywhere across the states, people have been sending in the stories of America's veterans. And we get some hundred or so collections every week that come into us. Uh, we do this primarily through oral histories of people sitting down and interviewing what we call the veteran in their life. And it could be someone in their family, someone in their community, someone they worship with, someone they shop with, or someone they just don't know, but uh, they become an acquaintance. And we encourage people to do that. Uh, so whenever I come out to a, to a uh, venue like this, or even run into somebody on the street, I ask them, who is the veteran in your life? And each one of us has a veteran in their life. It may not be a family member, but it may be what I just talked about. It's someone that, that you know or someone you run into or someone you it's just an acquaintance or a friend of a friend or whatever. And I would encourage you to think about uh, participating in the Veterans History Project. Uh, if you don't know it, there is an information center down here on the first floor uh, 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 in the Madison Building, room LM109, an information center where you can get more information about interviewing veterans. We have our field kit that we can hand out to you that tells you everything you need to know about interviewing a veteran or collecting materials if a veteran is uh, passed on, things like photographs, letters, diaries, and we'll hear a little bit about photographs today, and you get a sense of what treasures those can be uh, for, uh, for projects such as ours. Uh, and if you want to take it a step further, I just want a, a, another small advertisement. This is a, a document that was recently uh, 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 published. It is or doing veterans' oral history. And we're very proud of this because this was done through the Oral History Association uh, here in America. Uh, we uh, worked with them, a uh, professional oral historian, put this book together. And it tells you in a little bit more detail than what we tell you in our field kit about how to interview veterans. This is available if you'd like to get it. We'll talk to you later about how you can get a copy of it. But it really is uh, taking it a step further. I'm really proud that uh, we had this now. Um, so enough about the project, let's talk about our guest today. Uh, Adam Harrison Levy is a writer and a freelance documentary film producer and director. And as I said, he has interviewed veterans. He knows veterans. He's worked for the BBC uh, in documentaries on From D-Day to Berlin and the Nuremberg Trials, as well as uh, a photographic uh, gallery exhibition on Hiroshima. Uh, he is currently uh, teaching at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, but previously has been with Wesleyan University and Yale University. If you've read the uh, promo to this, uh, to this uh, particular talk, it talks about a photograph, uh, a suitcase full of photographs of Hiroshima and some other veterans uh, involved in this and intertwining this into nonfiction. I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Adam Levy Harrison. Excuse me. Let's try this again. Adam Harrison Levy, excuse me for Thank you all for turning out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Monica, for inviting me here. Uh, it is an honor, definitely. And um, I guess today, just to kind of sketch out uh, what to expect, I am going to talk about some unknown photographs uh, from the beaches of D-Day. Um, which I turned up a number of years ago. I'll talk about that. 
uh, a little bit of um, kind of philosophy and methodology of interviewing, and then a cultural history of the interview, which I have to say I'm putting together at the moment. Um, and it starts with the 19th century and moves up to the present. It's definitely a subjective history. It's not the story, but it is a story. Um, and no one seems to have written about the history of the interview, so I'm keen on that. And the last part, which Bob mentioned, is the story of 700 photographs that were found in a suitcase uh, on the street corner in Massachusetts. And my story of trying to figure out what happened to those uh, photographs and how they came to be there. So, hopefully this will work. Another click? Okay. So, um, as Bob mentioned, I've been working as a documentary filmmaker. And one of the things that we do as researchers, obviously, is uh, turn up interviewees and turn up documents. And this was about five years ago, and I was working on this big series for the BBC, and it was finished. It was editing, and the producer called me up and said, look, we need this document. Can you go find it? And it was at the Brown University Library. And I called the archivist there, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are archivists, a wonderful breed, know everything in sort of lateral, serendipitous ways. And they said, this uh, man said to me, do you know Manuel Bromberg? He was the U.S. war artist. And I kicked myself because I had been working on this for a year, and I had never heard of him. Uh, and it was done, and filming was done. I thought, well, I have to go check this, this U.S. war artist. I didn't know anything about the U.S. war artist program. So I went to visit Manuel Bromberg. He lives in Woodstock, New York, um, in a beautiful modern house in a ravine that looks out over Woodstock. And I drove up, came to the door. He greeted me, very kind of stately, impressive man with a big, strong brow and swept back gray hair, sort of like you'd expect a 80-year-old artist to look like. And we went in, I went in, and it was very important for interviewing to kind of make that initial bond. We sat down, his wife brought us tea. We talked for a little while. I told him up front that I couldn't include him in the film, but I was very interested in the story and his work as a US war artist. Um, and then we went into the, uh, his wife cleared the table, and we went into the dining room, and I took out my tape recorder and took out my notebook and started an interview. So, I think an interview should feel like it's a conversation, but it's a conversation with an agenda, and that agenda is held by you, the interviewer. So ideally, that interview and that agenda is not a rigid set of unalterable questions, but something that's more fluid, a narrative with a through line, like a plot, but leaves room for free association and improvisation. So it's kind of like jazz. There's a structure, but within that structure, there's room to kind of pick up on the free association and improvise. And two important parts of that is instinct and improvisation. Uh, and I should be clear that I'm not a hard news interviewer. Um, I tried that once, it was a complete disaster. Um, my style is to evoke rather than to provoke. And for me, an interview is something that takes place between people. It's literally an interview. And I like to think of it as a collaboration between myself and their interviewee. So in a way, you're sort of helping the interviewee, art interviewer, I mean the interviewee, articulate a version of themselves or a version of their memory that maybe perhaps they haven't articulated before to themselves. So in that way, a good interview is never impersonal, it's personal. Um, and you become, in effect, a partner in their own understanding of themselves. So it's a skill that forces you to listen. You have to train yourself, literally almost, to get out of the way, to shift attention away from yourself, to focus the conversation on the interviewee. So in other words, an interview is a journey into the interior landscape of another person. At the core, you're asking, what is it like to be you? So the question, what is it like to be you, has a history. As a journalistic genre, the interview evolved in the mid-19th century from verbatim printed court reports in newspapers using direct dialogue. But it was in August 1859, when the journalist Horace Greeley traveled to Salt Lake City to interview Bingham Young, that most historians agree the first interview took place. 
And it was interesting, it was in a question and answer format that we'd recognize uh, now. Um, and it was quite respectful, but also pointed, especially on polygamy. Uh, as you can expect, everyone wanted to know about polygamy in the Mormon uh, uh, religion. And Greeley questioned Young, respectfully, uh, and Young replied that he had 13 wives, and we now know it was closer probably to 70. So there's a little bit of, as always in interviews, a little bit of um, shading of the truth there, right at the very beginning. So there's something about that, because in the origin of the interview and the fact that it comes from trial court reporting, there is something that shadows the whole genre, um, no matter how empathetic or nuanced the interviewee, interviewer is, because it's part inquiry, part voyeurism, and part cat and, cat and mouse verbal exchange. Uh, so this journey into someone's interior landscape is inevitably also a probe. Successful only if the interviewer brings back something meaningful from this interior world. So um, Saul Bellow, the writer, understood this when he described an interview as being like thumbprints on his jugular. At its darkest, there's an edge of attack woven into the very form, an attack aimed at personal revelation, the so-called killer interview or jugular journalism. Interestingly, there was, almost a dis there was a distrust of the interview almost simultaneously with its origin. And here's a story to illustrate this. Oh, yeah. So in 1889, Rudyard Kipling undertook a journey to interview his literary hero, Mark Twain. After relating his difficulties of finding Twain's house, Kipling succeeded in convincing Twain to sit down for an interview. They first discussed, and it's incredibly boring, copyright, <laughs> if you can believe it, uh, two writers. <laughs> uh, and then Kipling, as he says, growing bold and feeling that, I'd have few, feeling that I had a few hundred thousand folk at my back, asked Twain if he was planning on writing a sequel to Tom Sawyer. <laughs> I have a notion of writing the sequel of Tom Sawyer in two ways, replied Twain. In one, I would make him rise to great honor and go to Congress. <laughs> and in the other, I would hang him. <laughs> Kipling was overawed by Twain. Quote, I should have ample time to look back to that meeting across the graves of days, he wrote. He spoke on and I listened, groveling. But ironically, two years later in 1892, Kipling himself was the subject of a request to be interviewed. According to his wife's diary, two reporters from Boston visited them at their house. Kipling was outraged at their request and refused. Interviewing, he said, quote, is a crime just as much of a crime as an offense against my person, as an assault, and just as much merits punishment. It's cowardly and vile. No respectable man would ask it, much less give it. So I think this speaks to the difference between being the journalist assailant as opposed to the journalist victim. Or maybe it speaks to the hypocrisy of writers. So the growing popularity of the interview through the 19th century was fueled by the whoops, was fueled by the rise of mass education, mass market publications, and evolving readership with a hunger for a more intimate understanding of the public figures. It was also fueled, I would suggest, by the development of realism in the novel and an emphasis on dialogue, scene, and character. And central to all these changes was the increasing importance of women especially in terms of education and the growth of readership in newspapers and in mass publications. So the word interview, the, in the journalistic sense of the word, first appeared in the OED in 1869. And ironically, the same year, the nation said, the interview at present managed is generally the form of a joint product of some humbug of a hack politician and another humbug 
of a newspaper reporter. But the humbug was catching on. In Britain, where traditionalists in the press opposed the interview as a newfangled American invention that lowered reading standards, it was called an epidemic. In the first six months of 1884, one newspaper, the Pall Mall Gazette, had an incredible 79 interviews. According to its most accomplished interviewer, W.T. Steed, interviewing was, quote, the most interesting method of extracting the ideas of the few for the instruction and the entertainment of the many. Another distinctive factor of the interview is what I call intimacy construction. The story of the reporter, usually in the first person, visiting the politician or the writer or the actor and writing about that encounter in an almost novelistic approach. And it wasn't until much later that anyone thought of interviewing the common man. Uh, and I'm thinking of Studs Terkel, whose amazing books, as you all know, I see lots of nodding heads, uh, The Good War, Working in Division Street, really kind of broke the genre wide open. Um, and it remains an incredibly important tradition, the, uh, the Studs Terkel tradition. Uh, and I would call that the evocation school rather than the provocation school. Um, and it continued through new journalism in the writings of Gay Talese, who in the early 60s was using uh, sort of evocative interviews to stitch incredible stories about Frank Sinatra and Joe DiMaggio famously. Um, and I would say it's even become, like it, it, it definitely informs what's going on here. Uh, absolutely, that you're sitting down with the common folk and evoking their stories and kind of giving them a sense of timelessness and taking an appreciation of those words that maybe 50, 60 years ago wouldn't have been listened to. And that's certainly what happens a lot in documentaries. Um, and I would say that's a synthesis of oral history and a collaborative interview. So here's Joseph Pulitzer. And in the 19th century and early 20th century, he kind of, you know, he's a famous newspaper innovator, and he endorsed a method of interviewing uh, that stressed visual description and the evocation of a sense of place. And it's been speculated that's because he was partially blind. And he appreciated the importance of detailed description of interviewees in order to communicate character. So in a memo to his editors, he asked writers to, quote, stress the importance of giving a striking, vivid pen sketch of the subject, also a vivid portrait of his domestic environment, his wife, his children, his animals, etc. And now we take that for granted, but this was a complete innovation. So in the 1920s and 1930s, the form of the interview was solidifying into something we would recognize today as, say, a cross between a New Yorker profile and a traditional Q&A. Uh, for instance, there's an astonishing interview with Al Capone uh, conducted in 1931, and this is a great line of character description, quote, he leaned a bit further back in his comfortable office chair and lit for the 17th time his Tampa cigar. <laughs> So the post-war, and in the post-war, the influence of uh, psychoanalysis, I think, gave the interview more depth and intensity, while television was kind of sliding in the other direction, especially in the late 1950s, and began to exploit the appeal of the attack interview, and most effectively, Mike Wallace. Uh, and on YouTube, there's amazing footage of him interviewing Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's a grilling, uh, not like what we see today, but it's the beginning of that really probing, difficult, put you on the spot interview. Wait for it. Another click? You're right. So this is um, Truman Capote, and he elevated the interview into a form, form of nuanced portraiture and used manipulative techniques to woo his interviewee into confessional revelations, as he did spectacularly with Marlon Brando in 1957. And I suggest you all read that, because it's quite striking what he gets Brando to say. But on the other end of the spectrum, and with growing popularity, was the celebrity interview as practiced by Hollywood magazines in the 30s and 40s. And these, of course, exploited the desire of the audience to get an insider view of the elegant glamour and exquisite romance of Hollywood lives. And the fact that most of those interviews were written by publicists only intensified their appeal, because it made them as artfully fictitious as the movies in which they stars appeared in. So authenticity in the interview was turned inside out by the Paris Review, whose interviews starting in 53 with Faulkner, Hemingway, uh, Nabokov, um, were given back to the writers for post-interview editing and rewriting. 
And the argument was that they believed, the Paris Review editors, that this gave a clear and more true essence of the interview than a verbatim transcript would have done. And that's an argument that still kind of exists today, whether an edited interview, uh, cleverly enter, uh, edited ethically, is a compression and is a more like a pungent uh, distillation of an interviewee's story than just a verbatim transcript. So finally, I would say the apotheosis of the interview was Jen Winner's, Winner's 30,000 word interview with John, Levin, John Lennon that ran in the 1971 issue of Rolling Stone. Ramshackle and free flowing, it's a remarkable portrait of an artist, witty, cantankerous, opaque, and charming by turns. And now, as I think all of us understand, we're, we're in a splintered landscape. Openness and spontaneity in interviews with well-known artists, actors, and writers have all but disappeared. Ironically, at a time when transparency and individuality are declared to be the hallmarks of the digital age. And there are a few remaining pockets on radio and podcasts. But the feedback post, the Facebook post, the selfie, and the tweet effectively bypass the interviewer and allow for a more curated and controlled presentation of the self. However, for the everyday person, it's a wonderfully liberating moment when people can tell their own stories directly and powerfully in ways not even imaginable 10 years ago. On our cell phones, we can interview ourselves, our families, our lovers, and strangers, and upload the footage to YouTube or Vimeo, and broadcast our own explorations of the inner landscape of others. So, I returned to Bromberg's house about four or five times. <clears throat> um, and at first, as you might have experienced with veterans, he stuck to just the broad outlines of his war. He was stationed in England, uh, and his assignment was to sketch some of the soldiers there. He watched the um, exercises in preparation of D-Day at a place called Slapton Sands. He was uh, on, the, on the boats that went over to Normandy. He was there just after the invasion. And then he would tell me about going through Europe uh, with partly with the Third Army and into Paris. But it was very um, restrained. Uh, and I did want to dig close uh, in deeper. I mean, I did want to sort of probe his inner landscape. And as I kept going back and going back, he loosened up a little bit more. Um, and on the third visit, I noticed there's another structure on the, on the property. And he said, oh, he mentioned that his daughter lived there. And on the third visit, he said, oh, I'm going to go show you my studio. And I said, oh, I thought that's where your daughter lives. He said, no, no, it used to be my painting studio. And so we walked out there. Um, it was cold, and he gave me a tour of his studio. He showed me his sketchbooks that he had sketched, uh, he had been sketching the whole time. I mean, that was part of his uh, assignment. Um, and literally, as we were leaving the studio, and I kid you not, I said, what's that cardboard box over there? And he said, oh, those are my photographs. And I said, photographs? He said, yeah, the photographs I took during the war. So these are Bromberg's photographs, many of which had never been seen before. Quote, here I am with all this debris of war, bodies, burnt homes, destroyed bunkers and minefields and hedgerows and orchards. For an artist, this is an exhilarating subject matter. It was the biggest subject matter you could get. The journalists that I knew, they were thinking in terms of the morning papers, the deadline, getting the scoop. And that's not what the artist was there to do, make a scoop. That's why they walked past all this incredible stuff. No one was interested in the non-heroic. That's what I was interested in. I took all these pictures, and I had no one to send them to. So I'm interested in how you take the raw material, raw material of an interview, such as an interview with a veteran, and transform that into a narrative based on facts, 
uh, but with the emotive power of fiction. So here's a test uh, example. Manuel Bromberg had his orders folded neatly in his pocket, two official pieces of paper, both from the War Department. He was in the Army, a carbine slung over his shoulder, standard issue leather boots, a sergeant's five stripes on his arm. But unusually, a green leather sketch, back, sketch pad in his hands and a Leica camera slung from his neck. Bromberg was an official US war artist. His orders were to depict the impact of war on you as an artist, a human being. The military had shipped him to London. He had spent almost a year there waiting for action. His assignments had been to cover the mechanical crews of the 8th Air Force, tending the B-17s, as well as the American GIs in the port city of Hull, who were unloading cargo ships. He had made hundreds of drawings of the men down on the docks as they hauled and lifted. Out on the airfields, he was captivated by the relationship between men and machines. Bromberg was struggling under the burden of his mission, the responsibility of observing the day-to-day -day work of the soldiers and then transforming those observations into art. In order to aid his memory, he would take a photograph to capture the stance of a soldier against the skyline or the angle of the light or the markings of an airplane. But now Bromberg was standing on Omaha Beach D-Day plus six, quote, the bodies were floating in. It was a cross between Dante's Inferno and the biggest junkyard I'd ever seen. LST landing ships were bashed in like tin cans. German pillboxes blasted open. Empty shells, twisted metal rods, chunks of concrete all littered the sand. Jeeps and half tracks everywhere, German POWs penned in behind barbed wire like cattle. A field hospital had been set up in an orchard. Big khaki army tents like circus high tops emblazoned with medical crosses. In the pre-op section of the tent hung a white curtain which marked the entrance to the operating theater behind. A doctor greeted Bromberg and led him on a tour. The medics had been performing surgery for almost 24 hours straight. Soldiers lay on stretchers everywhere, even on the grass floor. The doctor walked briskly through the operating theater to the rear of the tent. He flung back the flap. Bromberg peeked out, expecting the worst. Look at that, said the doctor. Bromberg looked around, confused. That's right, said the doctor. No arms, no legs. We saved their arms and their legs. Every minute, every few minutes, a dusty ambulance would pull up. The wounded were streaming back from the interior of Normandy like sausages coming off the line. The fighting in the hedgerows was fierce, bloody, and unexpected. Bromberg was now back inside the tent, gazing at a soldier stretched out under the lamps. He hated himself for thinking it, but the soldier looked good, his arm flung back and his torso vulnerable under the glare. He took out his sketchbook and drew furiously. The soldier's midsection, stripped of his uniform, reminded him of Greek statues he used to sketch as a kid in the Cleveland Museum of Art. He tapped his pocket, feeling for his papers. Quote, our committee expects you always to be more than a news gatherer. Our choice was difficult. Many of the finest artists were physically and emotionally unsuited for this work. His order stated that he was to depict the war like Goya's famous series of etchings the disasters of war, that's what they actually said. To depict the war like Goya, he thought. How the hell do they expect me to do that? Quote, I didn't think historically, the, histor the historians had to do that. I was thinking pictorially, artistically. The artist has a whole different set of problems. How do I make this thing really have timelessness? When the nurse moved away, he lifted his camera and took a picture. So that's one um, 
experience of working with an archive. And now I'm going to move on to a different experience, interestingly, that also did flow from a BBC project. Uh, this was a drama documentary about Hiroshima. came out about six or seven years ago. Um, and it was very much a drama documentary, not in a cheesy way, but it was almost like halfway to a movie. And I was doing background research and interviews in America, uh, sort of background interviews. Some of them did appear, actually, um, for the, for the uh, film. And as often happens, similar story, uh, in the course of my research, I heard this, someone sort of, I think it was a historian, said, oh, I heard this thing where 700 photographs were found in a suitcase on a street in Massachusetts. And, you know, I don't really know about it, and it's kind of a mystery. And when the production was over, I thought, wow, that's a mystery worth tracking down. So I literally got in my car and drove up to uh, Watertown, Massachusetts. So one rainy night in Watertown, Massachusetts, a man was taking his dog for a walk. On the curb in front of a neighbor's house, he came across a pile of trash. Old mattresses, cardboard boxes, a few broken lamps, and in the heap of garbage, he spotted a battered suitcase. He bent down and pulled it out. He turned the suitcase over and popped open the clasps. Inside, he found a jumble of black and white photographs, most of them bent, broken, water-stained, a few of them hole-punched, and um, there were images of a ruined city. And he snapped the, the suitcase closed, tucked it under his arm, and practically sprinted home. Uh, and standing at his kitchen table, he opened the suitcase again. And he was looking at something no one really had seen before, the effects of the first use of the atomic bomb. So in a dispassionate and scientific style, the 700 photographs he found inside the suitcase that evening uh, depicted a city seared by a new form of warfare. And now, 70 years after the bombing, their story can finally be told. The mystery. So the Deluxe Town Diner is a classic air-streamed diner decked out in high 1950s style with uh, ivory and turquoise exterior and those glass bricks. Um, it's a diner as quintessentially American as a Twinkie. And standing inside was a man wearing brown corduroy trousers, a dark blue sweater, tortoise shell glasses, and his hair was kind of sticking straight up on top. Uh, he kind of looked like a, a doofy film professor, <laughs> and, um, rather than a diner owner. Uh, his name was Don Levy, no relation, and he was a connoisseur of found objects. And finding the photographs that night was obviously the peak of his trash diving career. And he didn't know what to do with them. So he stuffed them, they were in terrible shape as I said, and he, um, he stuffed them into binders. He put them in like plastic sleeves which you would all kind of groan if you saw them and stuffed them into binders uh, and put the, uh, the binders in his basement. And I asked Levy when I turned up if he had ever tried to discover who owned the photographs. And he said that it never really occurred to him. So I proposed that we try. So we went to the town hall and looked up all the names who had owned the house in front of which the photographs had been found. Uh, and we Googled the names on the list. And we came up with a phone number for a man who had sold the house in 2000, uh, just around the time that Levy had found the suitcase. So we called him up on the phone. And literally, his voice shook with shock. The photographs of Hiroshima, you have them? I must have thrown them out when I, by accident when I was moving my stuff out of the house. Or I left them there, and the new owners threw them away. I never would have dumped them. I've been carrying them around with me since 1972. So Mark Levitt, the former owner of the house, still lived in Watertown. So we invited him to come down to the diner, and over blueberry pie and coffee, uh, we learned some more. So in 1972, he and a friend had been hired to clear out the basement of a house in Westchester. They were told to haul the contents away to a dump. And Mark Levitt took the photographs. His friend really looked like the look of the trunk, so he took the trunk. He, Mark, said he was haunted by the images. He said, something about them overwhelmed me. They don't represent the horror exactly because there are no bodies. They're clinical, but the power of them is really intense. So a few weeks after uh, meeting Levitt, and I'd say, look, can you get in touch with your friend Harlan? And he said, I don't know. I haven't seen him for 20 years. But um, I think it was five, six, seven days later, I got an email from Harlan Miller. No message, but there were photographs attached of a trunk sitting on a kitchen table, sort of like a, I don't know, like an eBay photograph from different <laughs> angles. <laughs> and on the front of the trunk, it said, Lieutenant R.S. Corsby. So 
The day after Japan surrendered, uh, Truman commissioned the United States Strategic Bombing Survey for the, for, excuse me, for the Pacific Theater of War. The mission of the survey was, quote, to measure precisely the impact of the bomb, to put calipers on it instead of describing it in emotive terms. So as part of the overall report, the uh, team uh, included something called the Physical Damage Division. It was made up of 150 men, including engineers, ordnance experts, interpreters, draftsmen, and photographers. And it was their job to examine the physical effects of the blast on the chimneys, walls, and reinforced concrete structures that survived, and to explain and um, document the impact, how the metal and concrete and wood reacted to the intense pressure of the heat of the atomic bomb. So um, soon after receiving this email of the trunk, I spent a few days in the archives at the New York Public Library, uh, reading through the War Department's history of the strategic bombing survey. And I confirmed that Corsby was actually part of Group 1 of the Physical Damage Division and had arrived in Hiroshima on October the 8th, 1945, and stayed through the end of November. So during those autumn months, the members of the division would fan out across the city every day to trace the blast paths, calibrate the bomb damage, and analyze the physical destruction of the city. And it was, as you can imagine, really tough going. As late as November, members of the team still came across uh, human skeletons that had not yet been cremated. And um, John Kenneth Galbraith actually was one of the members. And he wrote, the cities of Japan in those dark autumn days was a manifestation of unspeakable gloom. Only ashes and gaunt freestanding chimneys remained. So in order to document the damage, to identify, catalog, and really embalm Hiroshima for further analysis, seven members of the Physical Damage Division were tasked with the job of taking photographs of the destroyed city. Trained as an architect, Corsby was probably one of the draftsmen, but he kept 700 of the work prints, and those were the ones that ended up in the suitcase. So a little bit about Corsby. Nancy Knight, Robert Corsby's granddaughter, was guarded. Well, she said, I'll give you some background about our family, but you really have to talk with my mother. She's the only one who survived the fire. I was, the, I was only nine at the time. Fire, I asked? What fire? You'll have to talk to my mother. But I will, but I will say that I don't have many memories of my grandfather. I was just too young. But I do remember that he used to sit me down on his lap and we would listen to Madame Butterfly. Over the fireplace hung two samurai swords that he brought back from Japan. He joked that if I didn't learn one of the arias by the time I was 18, he was going to cut my head off. <laughs> so along with the task of documenting the devastation of Hiroshima, there was a second goal. To compile that data, sorry, the data was to be compiled to be used to help America to survive a nuclear attack at home. So here's the paradox. At the moment of America's total victory, there was simultaneously an awareness of the culture of the country's future vulnerability. So the way out of that paradox lay in the concrete structures that had survived the blast. In the words of the survey, men arriving at Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been constantly impressed by the shells of reinforced concrete buildings that still are rising above the rubble of brick and stone or the ashes of wooden buildings. The physical damage division studied those concrete shells as if they were blueprints for the atomic future. So a few years after the war, Corsby joined the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, which I'm sure you all know, and he was a bomb expert. And as director of the physical effects group, he brought his experiences from Hiroshima directly to bear on the testing of the physical infrastructure that the government was developing in order to survive nuclear attack. In other words, he was one of the first people to design the US military's first atomic bomb shelters. And according to a colleague who worked with the AEC, Corsby was, quote, quite a character. He was a pretty hard, high living guy. He loved his drinking at night. And he was very energetic and a sincere worker. He did a great job at this thing. Corsby's daughter, Nancy Mason was more forthcoming with her memories of her father. I know that he was traumatized by what he had seen. He went through a bombed out school in Hiroshima and that got to him, I know. He brought home two burned school books and a small sake cup that had been blackened by the blast. I asked Nancy to tell me a little bit more about her father's work with the AEC. 
So he went to, out west to Nevada quite a lot, she told me, when I was growing up. He was testing houses to see if they could withstand nuclear blasts. It was the time of duck and cover. When I was in the sixth or seventh grade, he was on TV. We got out of school early to watch the footage, uh, to watch the live, actually, I think. Uh, and they dressed him up in something that looked like foil. And they dropped him by helicopter into one of those test houses that they'd blown up in the desert. You've all seen that footage of when the wind rocks the house back and forth. That was all. He was on the ground for all those. Or not on the ground. He was dropped into those houses afterwards. Uh, and they called him the 24 karat hero. So in 1962, Corsby left government service and joined a private practice as an architect. He specialized, of course, in designing buildings that could withstand nuclear or natural um, disasters. Uh, for instance, his, one of his largest commissions, it's a bit strange, was the design of an immense underground blast shelter for the Johnson & Johnson Company uh, because they were wanting to protect their herd of milking cattle in case of a nuclear attack. <laughs> the fire. On the night of January the 7th, 1967, Corsby's daughter had a date. She was newly divorced, and she was planning on dropping her nine-year-old daughter off at her father's house. But at the last minute, her date canceled, and she decided to stay at home. Early the next morning, the phone rang. There had been a fire at her father's house. Corsby's house was a nine-bedroom Tudor mansion called Homewood in Ossining, New York. When, when Nancy and her daughter arrived, they were confronted by a house that was totally devastated. About 200 volunteer firefighters, four pumper trucks, and a hook and ladder had been called to fight the blaze, but to no avail. Robert Corsby, his wife Evelyn, and their 22-year-old son had all died in the blaze. The first assistant fire chief at the time was a man named Richard Apostolico. 44 years later, he still remembered the fire. It was one of the worst I'd ever seen. Some things you never forget. The house was built like a fortress. It had extra slate, thick roofs, and the windows were at least one quarter of an inch thick. We had a terrible time doing what we call ventilation. That's how you let the gases and burning fumes out of a building. It was something unreal. We had pike poles, and we still couldn't break the glass. As a result of the unusual construction, the house contained the fire like a furnace. Apostolico found Mrs. Corsby in the foyer, about 35 feet short of the front door. When I got there, he told me, I dragged her the rest of the way out, but it was too late. According to the obituary in the New York Times, the following day, she was found fully dressed in a skirt, sweater, and a pair of high-heeled shoes beside her. Then he tried to find Corsby. Battling the intense heat and smoke, it took Apostolico 20 to 30 minutes until he found him dead, draped over a lounge chair. He was trying to get out of a side door. He was close, about 15 feet away, but he didn't make it. According to the Times, Corsby was also fully dressed, including a necktie. Because of the intense heat, the firemen had to suspend their search and rescue, and when they resumed, they found Robert Jr. in his pajamas in an upstairs bathtub full of water. He was probably trying to keep away from the flames, said Apostolico, and he had died of smoke inhalation. So the Corsby had, had thrown a party the night before, which, according to witnesses, they had candles burning. After everyone had gone home, they probably had a nightcap on their living room sofa and dozed off. The candles in the living room must have tipped over accidentally, said Apostolico, or burned down in such a way that the drapery in the room caught fire. The drapery fell to the ground. There was tremendous heat. The fire was so hot that in the kitchen, which was 30 to uh, sorry, 50 to 60 feet away from the living room, we found the telephone trailing on the floor like it was a piece of licorice. Nancy Mason told me that the contents of the house were entirely destroyed, but down in the basement, where her father had meticulously boxed, filed, and stored all his records, almost everything <gasps> survived. A few days after the fire, still reeling with grief and shock, Nancy Mason emptied the contents of her father's house. She took, uh, she cleared everything out of the basement and she loaded all the stuff into her basement and she left them there while she struggled to reconfigure and reconstruct her life. So some five years later from that, she decided to weed things out. 
and she hired Harlan Miller and Mark Levitt to get rid of her father's effects and drag them all and dump them at the local dump. And that's when Harlan Miller salvaged the photographs and um, Mark Levitt, sorry, Mark Levitt took the photographs and Harlan Miller took the trunk. And Levitt stuffed the photographs in an old suitcase, which he eventually brought to his house in Watertown and stored in his basement. And when it came time to move, he either mistakenly threw it away or he left it and the people who bought the house threw it away. Either way, there it was, left in a pile of trash until Don Levy, out taking his dog for a walk one night, bent down and popped open the clasps. Thank you. We have a little bit of time. Um, questions? Is that, is that? Sure. Okay. Anyone have questions or comments? Yes. First off, where are the uh, both collections you're talking about? The Bram Burton still has his items. Yeah, so um, great question. So Bromberg uh, still has the photographs. Um, he wants to put them together in a book, and there's talk of an exhibition, but it's all very vague. And the daughters, I mean, as you'll know from, the daughters are sort of, there's contention in the family. So we'll see what happens. I mean, it's been at least five years, but they're there, they've been digitized, uh, they're safe, and we'll see what happens. Um, as I said, you know, there are hundreds, not as many as the Hiroshima photographs, and they're an incredible resource. So hopefully they'll see the light of day. I think they will. It's just a bit of time. Um, the Hiroshima photographs are a bit of a different story. Um, after I established the provenance, um, and I wrote a short article, actually, in the, in the Guardian. Ironically, it was the weekend that there was the tube bombing, whenever that was, five years ago. And so the staff at the Guardian couldn't make it in. And they had to like shorten the articles, like three people there was like a skeleton staff. And I don't think anyone on that day wanted to read about Hiroshima. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of sunk without a trace, I have to be honest. But there was a provenance established. And there was a securitist route, but Don Levy was able to sell them, I don't know for how much, I don't think it was a lot of money, to the International Center of Photography, which now has the photographs. They are online, and there was an exhibition that they mounted as a result. Um, and they are in the public domain because they were taken by the U.S. military. These are the contact prints, not the negatives. Um, and the exhibition has never traveled, much to my chagrin. I don't know why, because uh, it's an amazing thing. But the ICP itself has changed. They've just, they've just moved locations. So it's in their archive. It's accessible. And hopefully it will see the light of day again. But it has been out in the public realm. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so interviewing the, so the artist, Right. about their experiences. So how did, was his interview different than many others? Or yeah, yeah. the interview or whatever? What was your thoughts on Well, he was definitely the U.S. war artist, so he didn't interview anyone. I mean, he hung out with the troops, but he was constantly, I think he, he was very burdened by his, I mean, you can tell from his quotes. I think he had a breakdown. I mean, while he was doing it, he just could not square the reality of trying to capture this and this pressure of being like Goya. I mean, he kept coming back to that. But to answer your question, I mean, obviously he was an artist. He was reflective about his process. I think he was good at sort of making links to the common soldier. Um, I did interview a lot of people for the D-Day to Berlin. I would say he's probably more articulate than most because he was introspective and he was an artist and also because of that experience. I mean, it forced him to think more deeply about his failure, to be honest. Um, having said that, you know, when veterans, and I'm, I know you've experienced this, when they feel you know, it's a cliche, but it's true, and there's a reason why it's a cliche. They won't open up to their friends. They won't open up to their family. They will definitely talk to their colleagues and their fellow combatants. Uh, but I also think historians have an amazing opportunity, especially with their end of their lives, because they realize they're going to pass away, and this is their last chance. And sometimes the most amazing things are said. Um, and uh, secrets that have been kept for 40 or 50 years do come out. So that's, that's incredibly meaningful. <laughs> and it's great that you're capturing that because it is, you know, it's going it, to, what, two, three, four years from now, there's not going to be anyone. Yeah. Yeah, I think this afternoon is going to be more about the interview process and what I go through in terms of the nuts and bolts of how to evoke a question or evoke answers to ask the questions. 
that hopefully evoke the answers. Yeah, more like a workshop, less of a less of a talk. Yes, John. You uh, you talked about evoking rather than provoking. Um, how would you compare and contrast the uh, experience of interviewing veterans mm. with interviewing celebrities? Because you've done a bit of that as well. Yes. Um, You know, celebrities are so, most of them have their, as you'd expect, they have their routine down so kind of clinically sealed that the first question is really important. Like with a veteran, you can kind of start off relatively soft. Um, and you probably should do because they haven't been interviewed. But for like a real hardened movie star, I take a lot of time thinking what that first question is going to be. Because you want to signal, this isn't going to be just any old interview. I'm not repping for PR. You know, I'm trying to get a little, something that's a little bit different. So I spend a lot of time on those first questions. Um, I think with celebrities sometimes, I mean, this is a kind of funny story. It's good to allow for the tangent. Tangents are great in interviews. I mean, you get a little nervous, I think. If you do really great research, you can have the confidence that you're going to bring it back to what I call the spine of the interview. But if you're interviewing a celebrity, sometimes they go on a tangent sort of to test you. So here's a, I don't know why I think of this story. Jeff Daniels. Uh, and it was a terrible, it wasn't BBC, it was Channel 4. It was like 101, uh, 101 films to see before you die. It was like a list program. And we're to interview him about Dumb and Dumber. And this was like five years after the film came out. And obviously, you know, he has ambitions to be more than a Dumb and Dumber actor. And he was on Broadway, and, you know, he's gone on, obviously. And he's a really smart, intelligent actor. And he literally was in a hotel room, just what you don't want to do. Small hotel room, lights were set up, and literally he came down the hallway kind of slumping. You know, you could tell he didn't want to do it. He had his publicist kind of like pulling him by the nose. He sat down in the chair, and I didn't have a great first question, I have to admit. Um, and I said, you know... You know, can you describe what you did in Dumb and Dumber? Because we're doing this film. I mean, I was kind of bored. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me like, come on, buddy. I've done this so many times. Forget about it. And, like, I asked three questions, and I got those sort of no, yes, no answers. And I knew I was in deep, deep order. And I thought, I might, you know, this is just going to, I'm never going to be able to use this. So why don't I just ask him a really tangential question? I said, what are your 101 films to see before you die? And he kind of lit up. He's like, oh, no one's really asked me that before. And he started talking about Buster Keaton films. And I was sitting there, and I only had like 20 minutes, and I was like sweating, thinking, where is this going to go? But I thought, you know, I'll see where it goes. And he started talking about Buster Keaton and how he walks and how, you know, uh, you know, buildings fall on him, and he has this incredible physical grace. And he's going on, I see a little twinkle in his eye, and he said, yes, and when I was walking through the door in this scene in Dumb and Dumber, I was thinking about Buster Keaton. And I thought, oh, that's, that's all I need, you know? So he did know what he was doing. So an actor celebrity have the gift of knowing what you need. And they can play with you a little bit. A veteran might not necessarily know what the sound bite is. But the celebrity, a writer, an actor, will know what you need. And they'll either tease you with it or they'll give it to you. So that's a big difference. Thanks. Sure. Yes? Were there other um, war artists? And if so, where are their works? Great question. There are more US war artists. They did not have the funding or the support that the British war artists had. And actually, Bromberg was really bitter about that. They were literally, when they were in London, they had bunk beds and no supplies. And he was really pissed off. Um, because the British counterparts, um, Henry Moore, uh, Nash, Sutherland, they all had studios. And people would come and visit them. And they had a whole, they had the officers club. And they were all taken very seriously. And Sir Kenneth Clark, who went on to write Civilization, was in charge of their unit. So they were very protected. In fact, Bromberg would go visit them, and he was embarrassed because he couldn't invite them back anywhere to, like, all, all, you know, there was nowhere to go. There was no officer's club. Having said that, and I haven't done this research, he said that there was an exhibition of war art at West Westminster Abbey, and he was there. So some of the American stuff did end up in Westminster Abbey with the British war artists, but it was definitely not supported as much as the Brits uh, did. And I think the program still, I mean, you probably know, yeah. it goes on. Yeah. Um, and I think there were, there were a number of artists. Um, yeah. Right, in the Pacific, yeah. I don't, I should. Do you know their names? Yeah. And I think there was a book. Uh, it wasn't actually a very good book, but there was a book of their, of their art. And, and to be frank, it wasn't as good as the Brits. I mean, they, they really wasn't, which is a shame. 
Uh, having said that, it would be interesting to find out what survives. Uh, and who knows, maybe some of them also took photographs. They, I mean, he definitely was issued with that Leica. And that was a U.S. military issue, which is ironic because it's a German camera. But uh, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> I don't know how they got hold of it. All righty. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.